I'm out of here. So it does look like it does look like you've got the bourbon, the red label, the very first one. Yeah. yeah. So we got the um, the small batch. This was the one that uh, Shannon just sent to me. So we just launched that last week. Is the proof 101.7? Uh, yep, that's it. Yep, that's awesome. That's our first weeded bourbon we just just launched. So I'm glad you have that then. Okay. Yeah. No, we were excited about that one. Uh, then we have the raw, the four grain, and the genesis. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. The uh, the genesis. Uh, <laughs> I I cheated a little bit. These bottles are not uh, being freshly cracked tonight. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. That's what I it's mean, for. I'm super excited to have Ashley here because she's the she's she's much better at this than I am. I am the <laughs> I, I'm, I'm more the sales guy and the and the, the you know the dreamer that wants to do it. But she's she's been the rock star. Kind of helped us put all these blends together. So before you know, it's funny. Uh, a couple other distillers I know here in town uh, or in the state. I mean kind of close by we were talking about one day and you know when you first get into this and I used to sell a lot of the big brands and knew a lot about a little bit about making whiskey and we luckily we had some big guys that kind of came and helped us do the distilling but you know I knew that each barrel was different and I knew that blending it would be a little bit you know being consistent would be the on your small batch is probably the hardest part of for craft distillers once they get their own juice out I didn't realize it would be as hard as I expected uh, so having Ashley come on board with us and, and be our master blender and love her to, she'd probably give you a better background than her, but just teaching us how to profile barrels and how to blend to make a consistent small batch. Uh, it's something, something really, there's an art form to it. And the more I've studied it, you know, in Scotland, they don't even care about the master distillers. They really rock. They really talk about the master blenders. And yes. <laughs> and wow. so, uh, we learned a lot from her and actually from a couple other stores, I think heard, heard our first podcast with her and how she did the blending. And then they called her like, Hey, we might need your help too. So, uh, yeah. I'm excited been a for her. Few of those phone calls. She's got probably one of the best palettes I've ever seen. I'll, I'll tell you, just to give her a little brag. Cause I know she doesn't like to brag herself, but Jim Rutledge, uh, I'm sure you know who that is. The former oh, yeah. master of the four roses. He came down when we were first making our, he making our first distillate and he knew my, my investor, my main investor from, just selling whiskey for a long time and tasted our stuff. And he said, you know, you need to talk to this, this, this lady named Ashley Barnes that works for me. She's got the best palate I've ever, I've ever seen. And that a statement from a guy like that goes a long <laughs> way in my opinion. So no, that's uh, we're important. excited to have her on the team. It kind of worked out five years later that she ended up not working at Four Roses and now is yeah. out on her own and does a lot of different brands. But uh, so Ashley, I don't know if you kind of want to give them just a quick background. I kind of sent on the email. I knew who you worked for, but you probably have a little bit better well, background um, story than I do. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> I do, actually. I brought every bottle just in case. And uh, sure enough, there is. Awesome. I wasn't going to leave anything at home. So I, did, I didn't know. I don't know how she usually does, but I usually start with that one. I don't know why. It's just That's what I was looking. Yeah. Start okay. with that one and then go to the weeded and then four grain. So the weeded then, will be this one, the small batch. Yes. Yeah, the new. We did small batch. So yeah. Ashley, were you with Jim when we were doing barrel picks and all? I was with Market Square and they picked many a barrel up there with Jim. And I wondered if we might have met by any chance. So I did a few barrel picks, but as I picked the barrels before they came to you. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so they had to come through my lab and get approval prior to going to the customer. And as much as I love going and doing barrel picks and walking through that with everybody, I actually only got to do a couple. Uh, I did a couple with Jim and a couple with Al. Yeah. But it seems like if I was involved, it was, okay, we got to do it at the lab instead of actually going to Cox's Creek to do it because they were like, no, you can't leave the lab. So, so you know, <laughs> picked the barrels that we picked from. Yes. Yes. Wow, what a job. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I did. Um, all the single barrels came through my lab, and that's when I do the intro. Um, I did a lot of behind the scenes there. So yeah. you, well, you've so likely you, had a lot of my whiskey. Did you by any chance come over when we had Terry Bradshaw there? No, I, no, I did not. He, he picked with us one day. <laughs> yeah. The, the Terry I heard Bradshaw? all about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jim called us on a Saturday night. We were going to pick on Monday. And he said, you guys mind if someone comes and picks with you? And we said, of course not. And then he said, well, now I'll tell you who it is. And it was Terry Bradshaw and his wife. 
I remember that. that. Yeah. yeah. I, d I never got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the guys here, um, John and some of the guys at Market Square, and they, you know, they started picking barrels I mean, and maybe even in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I, I, I kind of joined up with them later, much later on, unfortunately. Um, but they, they just, I mean, they picked hundreds and maybe even thousands of barrels. No, and, not thousands. Um, I mean, more no. whiskey than I could ever. Not as many as you picked. Well, no. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad. I send her, I know we send her 40 or 50 barrels a month to profile. And uh, I don't know how she gets through them and stays sober. I have to learn that trick. Talent, pure talent. <laughs> uh, what proof? I know, he was pulling 104 samples for me today. Jeez. <laughs> You did 104 samples tonight. Do you proof them down pretty good bit? I actually don't. Wow. Um, so I, would, I haven't done 104 tonight. I'm picking up 104 from the distillery that they were pulling for me today. Good luck. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do. Um, so it depends on what I'm doing. Initially, when I'm going through for a review, like I'm taking notes to do potential blends later I do a lot by nose but then I'll taste each especially for like Pennington for the Davidson Reserve as of right now I still taste everyone now when we get to doing a whole lot more I might have to adjust my methods and and do a little more just by nose until we're in the final blend um, but for now I do taste everyone I have full notes on every barrel that goes into anything um, so you could say well that first batch you know, it has this note. Well, I can go back to every single barrel in that note, in that batch, and give you notes on each one and what that character likely came from. Um, but if I'm really looking for something subtle, I'll cut it down. So I said all that to say this, if I were to do them all by nose and not taste, I would cut them down more. Um, that's one of the things I did with Four Roses is we would cut things down to about 20%. And then if I'm selecting bottles for single barrel or private selection or store picks, then I would be able to go through and I got really good at going double fisting, going down a line and yeah. picking things out. Because yeah. <laughs> at that point, you, you may have 26 barrels in a row and you know what you're looking for. It's very consistent. So it's easy to just knock those out. Yeah. It's a little different when I'm working with You're looking for something. When you go to those, you're looking for something. You have right. something so, in mind. Right. So when, when I'm working with smaller craft distilleries, it, you're not as, it's not that they're not consistent, but it's not the same. You know, there's a lot more to sift through and make sure everything's going on correctly. Everything's looking right. And also what's going to work well in a blend. And so it's, yeah, I, I taste and smell every one and I don't cut them. She got, she let, she got to take us on a, when we took our whole group up to Louisville and she set up a couple of tours. Her partner, Monica, is pretty uh, connected to Buffalo Trace as well. And she used to work mm -hmm. there and obviously for us, they got us some private tours, some kind of, you know, not regular tours. Uh, everybody pros. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You're good. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, but anyway, we got in the lab, and of course, the people in the lab at Four Roses, they let us come in. They're like, oh, here, Ashley, you got it. And they just kind of let her take over. But I'll never forget, she was like looking around the thing. She's like, is there still that one barrel in here? What was that <laughs> barrel you were looking for? It was like a specific one she wanted to find. She wanted everybody to really? taste it. Yeah. Well, Bo oh, told me up there at, uh, at Buffalo <laughs> Trace, he told me once, and, and their tasters change from time to time. They rotate people in and out of the group that uh, does tasting for them. Uh, but uh, he said they uh, go down to 60% uh, that they sit in that room and taste all day. They tasted at 60%. I was a little surprised, mm -hmm. but not yeah. too surprised. I mean, if you're tasting whiskey all day. <laughs> you really grow accustomed to it. And for me, it's the way I take a sip. So I actually do not consume a whole lot. I barely take enough to get the coating and the finish and okay. So in doing so, I can taste a lot more for a lot longer before I really start experiencing palate fatigue. I have called her though at like noon. She's like, come on like barrel 30, Jeff. I'm gonna need a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, that's a good day. That's, you know, sometimes with a two-year-old running around, I need that. 
<laughs> Mama needs a good day at tasting, honey. Go go play with your blocks. I don't have a bottle of Davidson's with me. They're, all my bottles are in the car. Oh, no. I was like trying to get up here in time. I was like, oh man. That's no problem. I mean, we'll, I figure we'll, you know, we'll, we'll jump in and it's just more yeah. just hearing. I mean, I know you don't have the bottles with you, but still just, you know, your process and the things that went into this. I mean, that's, that's extremely valuable for us. So that's completely fine. Um, I think we said we we're going to do the Tennessee first. Yeah. Yeah. All of these I think that's, that's the best place to start. Yeah. So, they all yeah. Yeah. Everything you have is a blend. We, okay. do, we do single barrel picks for the Tennessee, the rye, and the bourbon, uh, the rep, uh, those three. Um, but yet, yeah, for now, we've got the small batches there. But we do have, have, the, have uh, single barrel picks available um, on, on those three. Okay. So, so obviously, you know, we first started, uh, you know, we, when we first started getting the whiskey, you know, we, we, we love bourbon. But being in Tennessee, we knew we had to have a Tennessee whiskey, right? I mean, you can't can't be from Tennessee and not have a Tennessee whiskey. So, I know. <laughs> but we wanted to do something a little different, and we've got a little saying: we're trying to get out there in the world that not all. If you think all Tennessee is going to taste like that one, then that would mean all bourbon tastes like Jim Beam. Yeah. And so we really we're excited about the Tennessee whiskey because it isn't a normal Tennessee whiskey. So I'm gonna let Ashley kind of give you. Some of her tasting notes because she's got much prettier tasting notes than I do. Uh, I'm interested in what you were. Spot. Yeah, what were you yeah. looking for in this Tennessee whiskey? What What did you want to do? Me, me personally, um, I've always been a fan of a high rye kind of mash bill. So, uh, I, I'm not not just because she came from there, but you know, one of my favorites from selling was Four Roses. Uh, I've always liked the kind of style that they have. Um, so we definitely went with a similar mash bill of, of a Four Roses style or Buffalo Trace kind of higher, higher rye mash bill. Uh, it's 70% corn, 25% rye, 5% malted barley. Um, all of our grain except for our malted barley is grown locally in Tennessee. So we use Tennessee white corn in all of our recipes instead of yellow number two dent. Um, and I don't think it's a massive difference that you would tell straight off on the mouthfeel. I do think it gives a little bit more residual sugar, maybe a little bit more sweetness uh, than the yellow number two. Um, but we want, it was really important that we use a local grain. Uh, and then we grow our, we, we have a farmer that grows our Tennessee white, right, white zero rye and our Tennessee red winter wheat as well. Um, no, not a lot of, not a lot of barley grows around here. So we, uh, <laughs> there's another distiller here that actually tried to grow his own barley and built his own malt house. And, Luckily, he's got a lot of money because he said it hasn't worked for a few years. <laughs> so, are, those, uh, are those softer grains, the Tennessee grains? I don't. They're think a little not. softer, like on the palate, yeah. but not really. I, honestly, I think you're going to see a big expression in the rye more so than in the Tennessee. I think it gives it a little more of like a a nutmeg maybe even a little more clove character you know it's a little spicier but not in the traditional way yeah I mean, I, it's funny we started with this one because uh i i got to visit with jeff uh yeah I mean, it was that march of this year i think it was um, right before, before the pandemic started i guess <laughs> yeah it was literally like the day before uh oddly enough and we we spent a couple hours at the distillery and we tasted a similar lineup at the time and the Tennessee's just kind of stole my heart in the end, even though I'm a bourbon guy. I mean, the Tennessee whiskey for me just kind of won me over from day one. Um, and I, and I, tasting it, it's been a little while, but I remember why at, tasting it now. Yeah, I love the high rye content. I feel um, like the other two big Tennessee whiskeys that are out there, obviously Jack and George, because everybody knows them. I feel like they're very corn heavy mm -hmm. to me. They're very, they're, they're very, they build a lot of their character off the corn, which we do have a lot of corn, but I think we, which we've got a little bit more of that. I've always been more a kind of a rye fan. Yeah. So I feel like we've got a little bit more of those spicy kind of fruit notes that you get off a of rye and some allspice and nutmeg kind of flavors that not just a powerful corn heavy kind of whiskey. Yeah, it's got a more bold flavor profile than 
what one would typically think of a Tennessee whiskey. It's like a Tennessee whiskey with a bourbon kick, kind of. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm getting. And I, I get the rye, I get the spices that you're talking about, but I definitely get the corn back there in the background. I mean, the corn seems to be the underlayment in it. Yeah, it's more of like a, a base or a structure to it rather than the front runner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the profile goes. But I mean, it's, it's still, even with that rye, you know, it's exceptionally smooth. And, and, but it just got that rye character that, you know, I'm a big fan of rye. You know, high rye, in my opinion, is, is the way to go. And I, I get that rye character here, but it's still just so smooth and drinkable. And it, it's surprising, you know, a little more heat. Than I expected at 96 proof, but in a good way. I mean, I, I like the burn. I think it should have, it should make you feel warm. And, and, and I get that Kentucky hug, Tennessee hug. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, it's Where funny when we were working wrong? on the bourbon blend and we were trying to decide what proof. I've gotten so used to tasting barrel strength now. Yeah. But I'm just like, I know for, for business wise, it would do better to sell products at like 90 proof and lower. But I just can't seem to bring myself to do it anymore because I like I, I like stuff at a higher proof now. I like man, to have yeah. a little bit. Of I did an ice cube. <laughs> yeah. So where are these warehouse? The warehouse there in Nashville? Yes, sir. Uh, we've got we we everything's done on our home base, our on our one campus right now. We will we are running out of barrel space, so we'll have to find some new barrel houses somewhere. It'll stay in Tennessee, obviously, but Tennessee whiskey. One Tennessee whiskey has the same five laws of bourbon, uh, but it's got two extra. It's got the charcoal mellowing uh, through Tennessee sugar maple. Now we do a very, very light mellowing. We don't do a big tank. We drip it just through a little tube just to kind of, we, we want it to be more of an additive and not a subtractive um, kind of compared to some others. Uh, but then Tennessee whiskey also has to be aged in Tennessee. Uh, they passed that law about three or four years ago because some, I guess, it's a battle between a couple of big guys where maybe they were moving some barrels to Kentucky and back and forth. So, yeah, we have to stay in Tennessee with our barrels now. They can't, they can't leave. Okay. So, and this is the one where I really learned about blending because, I mean, we, we probably made more of this in the bourbon than any of the other. We kind of make those three recipes or our three main recipes that we rotate through 17 cooks. We kind of go 17 cooks, 17 cooks, 17 cooks, and rotate through. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Ashley first came on, we were working on this. Is she profiled and she kind of got all our barrels. It's just amazing how different two barrels barreled on the same day, sitting right next to each other for, for four or five years on the shelf, tasted. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one that was really, this is where we really learned about the blending techniques from Ashley was with the Tennessee. Cause we, she basically brought us things. She said, here's like three different directions you could go. Um, yeah. You got to tell me. Out of like 16 barrels. Go. Yeah. That first batch, I think you guys gave me 16 barrels to start with and I ended up using 11, but there were three very distinct profiles in that. Well, yeah, I'm a fan of that Tennessee. No, no, can, you, 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 or, can you talk age on these or approximate age? What, what are we dealing with here? Mm -hmm. Everything in front of you is four years old or older. Okay. Um, everything is also uh, not 100% uh, grain to bottle, made, made gr milled, distilled, aged, and bottled by us. Uh, there's nothing sourced in anything. Um, now, Currently, the Tennessee whiskey, uh, our current blend is probably closer to a five-year-old now. Um, uh, the bourbon, the red label over there, that is a blend of really, it's, there's some six-year-old barrels down to about, what, about four and a half-year-old, I think, in that blend is what we ended up with. Um, so there, there's, I think there, what, what, that ended up being a non-barrel blend on that first batch, is that right, or eight? We, we had eight and we added ninth, right? Yeah. 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 So I think like three or four of those barrels t literally turned turned six in like 30 days. And then the, the other ones are kind of a, a little wave between four and a half and five and five and a half. And then the rye is about four and a half to five year old. And then the blue label in the middle is mostly four year old. That's kind of our four grain. And then the, the orange bottle, the Genesis that we'll probably finish with, that's our first six year old bottled and bond. It's my I, was, I was excited right when you sent yeah. that email. <laughs> Let me know about that. That was exciting to see. Not only the six year, but the bottled and bond designation. That 
I, I just get excited when I see that. I mean, that that's a great thing. So, what kind it's of my fa- it's my favorite thing that we've done so far. Uh, what kind of proof are you putting them in the barrels at? Our wheat we put in at uh, 115. Oh, wow. um, our Tennessee whiskey we enter at 120, and our rye we enter at 125. Okay. So we we went ahead and poured the uh, the small batch bourbon, the the five and six year blend. Um, and so this one's a lower uh, corn count. This is I think it says 60 percent. Yeah, this is 60 percent corn, 22 percent wheat, 18 percent malt, malted barley. Um, this is kind of our our weeder, I guess you could say. You know, that's the term these days. Is I guess is weeder. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> All the stores uh, I share on to me because it doesn't say weeded bourbon on the label. I'm like, because it's a bourbon, but I guess we'll have to change that so people know it's a weeded bourbon. But uh, yeah, so we, uh, just to go back, we, we make three recipes that's kind of our, our signature recipes. We make our weeded recipe, we make our Tennessee whiskey recipe, and we make our rye recipe. We've got some other things we've thrown around, like we've got some wheat whiskey where we had a lot of grain left over, and we messed around with some different rye recipes. We've got some malted barley stuff where we had some extra grain laying around, but very small runs. Those are our three main ones. And then the Genesis that you'll taste at the end, that is our Tennessee whiskey recipe, but not charcoal mellowed at all. So um, we we run through those. We waited on this bourbon because we felt like we can always use a little bit more time. Um, And we didn't want to launch a Tennessee whiskey and a bourbon at the same time. Uh, We wanted to kind of launch those separate and we figured the bourbon could use a little bit more time. So I'm not going to lie, we, this, this turned out great, but about two years ago, when we first started tasting with Ashley, I was a little nervous. Like, I was we'd nervous. Go, we <laughs> go through a little phase, I guess, at three, three and a half years old, where I was like, oh, no, I got a lot of this, and I'm not really loving it. <laughs> but It's the awkward, like, puberty phase. Yeah. <laughs> it you is. Know, you covered it in is. acne, really awkward, doesn't really talk to anybody. Yeah, it, it went through a, or through a and, rough patch. And then all of a sudden, a year later, we tasted it, and it like it was just like it had changed completely. Uh, so when you put put a, a, a few bur- barrels in a, a bottle like this bourbon, are you putting some aside to continue to age that uh, that same distillate? Because I feel like I feel like this bourbon is eight. It's very tasty. It's a good bourbon, and you can feel that it's probably got legs for the future. I just wonder if you hold barrels aside for uh, growing up. Oh yeah, we only sell, we've only put out about 20% of our, all of our inventory that we have available. Um, and actually probably a little less than that on most of our whiskeys. My main goal, I would like to get most of our small batch stuff in that six to eight year old range as it's every day. I, I feel like that's kind of, all, most of my favorite bourbons that to me, that's always been like the sweet spot. Yeah. But yeah, we'd love to one day have 10 and 12 year olds and older stuff. I mean, it's going to take some time to get there, but I mean, uh, we definitely- agree. Yeah, he does agree. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, you, you can you can certainly tell it if it's going to mature well or not. I think pretty quickly. Would you agree with that, Ashley? Oh, absolutely. And that's part of what I do with Jeff and the team over at Pennington's is, as I'm blending through, I'll designate barrels that need to age longer. And it isn't an it isn't necessarily that there's something wrong. It's just something that I project to age and mature well and do better in those times. Because I'm sure you guys have heard about the bell curve. I mean, it is very true. I don't know if it's exactly a bell, but some barrels will really start to show their colors and be magnificent a little before others. I mean, it's just like people. As you, you know, some people, some mature and hit their peak at teenagers. Some it takes till 30 or 40. You know, it just varies between the different barrels and it varies between the different products. You know, and we saw an extremely awkward phase with the wheat. And then as it started getting older, we really started realizing, hey, we're getting some phenomenal single barrels out of this. But Jeff will attest as we started working on the blend, I was like, this, this is insane. They don't play well together. They're great great solo, but they don't want to play well together. So it took a lot of finagling and working and some back and forth. And so we found a blend obviously that worked quite well, but you know, it's just 
there's we a even lot kicked of around the idea of just making tasting. single barrel only at one point. We're like, we took like I was voting barrels. for it. We yeah. had three or four single barrels that were all phenomenal. I mean, there was some times where Ashley will send us a list and she'll go through 50 barrels and she'll say, okay, here's some blending barrel. Here's some barrels that are good for blending. Here's some single barrels. Here's some barrels that need to age longer. And then every once in a while, she's like, here's some Whisper Creek barrels, you know, <laughs> or something like that. But, it, you know, just barrels that didn't work out well. But uh, we had four or five single barrels that were phenomenal. I mean, just unbelievable. Just drink, you know, drinking them as single barrels. And when you blended them, it's like it all just fell yeah. flat. Yeah. And we were, it was, it was mind boggling. I mean, I took some to my friends who are big bourbon drinkers. We have a friend's garage that called the Emporium. We all go over there and drink bourbon. Yeah. And I had a blend A and a blend B. And then the blend C was the, just a blend of A and B. And they were both, all of us like, A and B is great. What's wrong with C? And we're like, C is just a blend of A and B. And they're like, there's no way. No, no way. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. But then we came back to that same blend a week later, and it was great. It, it was it was weird. Um, we definitely we took the, the, the bourbon blend took a little bit. But just like you asked, yes, a minute ago, if there's some like, barrels which says should you age longer, it's funny. Sometimes she'll call and she'll say, "Hey, these four barrels need to get out now. They're ready." And that to me, that's funny because I always think that you could always use more time. But it goes both ways. There's there's sometimes where she calls and says, "Get this out of the barrel and sell it. This one is awesome right now." Oh, wow. Yeah, that's how we started with the single barrels because I was doing the Tennessee blend and I was like, hey, I'm not putting this in a blend. It's good. It needs to go now. Yeah, I think you guys have done some, but I was like, mm, you need to put this in single barrel. Yeah. Thank goodness Jeff is super, super nice. <laughs> well, this, uh, this, this weeded bourbon, you know, I, I didn't. It grows on you, doesn't it? No, it, it, it <laughs> definitely does. I just didn't, I did, nosing it. I wouldn't say it was weeded. Initially, I would have said the same thing. And now, I definitely have picked up more of that wheat character as I, I drank through it and kind of just took my time with it. But when I first started nosing that, that did not come across like a weeded bourbon. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's very pleasant. And I mean, I enjoy drinking it. I just kind of threw me a little bit because if I would have tasted that blind, I, I wouldn't have said weeded. Um, when she first sent me her first blends, I called her. I said, "Are you sure this is wheat and this isn't rye?" And she's yeah, like, I mean, "Yeah." I was, I was like, "Are you sure? Like, you sent me wheat because I, I'm with you, I could have swore there was rye in it." That's, some, what some of it. that's what I thought initially, but here, you know, ten minutes later, you, you, you can certainly tell it's a weeded bourbon. But I thought rye too. I was glad I didn't say it when you told me it was weeded. <laughs> yeah. yeah we it like is. breaking those boundaries. Well, you, you did, because I mean. <laughs> well, speaking of curveballs, let's get into that rye. I'm curious what you think of it now. Oh, well, you don't have to twist our arm. Uh, where's our rye at? Here, there it is. I think Luke knows this is usually my favorite go-to just because I'm a rye drinker. But um, we're getting most of our awards on the other stuff. But, man, I, I'm a big fan of rye. But. Yeah, I'm right with you, Jeff. I mean, rye is um, – and as much as I love bourbon, I, rye just has so much character and, and it's so unique. Uh, I gave you a big pour there, John. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's Uber if, someone, if I go to a bar, that's a lot of times when I go to a bar and they if I, they don't have Davidson. Now they have Davidson. I drink that, but uh, you know we didn't have that out till a year ago. But I, my fell safe was always just if they had the baby size sitting on the back bar. Oh yeah, you just can't go wrong. No, that's. <laughs> This is a very drinkable rye, and it has a great rye finish on it. I mean, the finish is sort of like an exclamation point on this particular rye. It's just a, mm -hmm. it's soft in your mouth, and uh, it has a it's a good blended feeling, uh, and you really get the rye in the uh, aftershock, you know. Not we, a uh, in your we, face punch. Yeah, we cheated. We decided yeah. when we when we decided to do this, you know. A lot of ryes, you know, are got to be 51% rye. I don't really know what the Sazerac rye recipe is, to be honest with you, but no, I know neither. that most people out there are used to the 95.5 from MGP. That's kind of the, the standard go-to that's out that everybody knows about, but we just decided to go all the way and just do 100% rye. Why not? My distillers hate it. I mean, literally hate it because it's like cooking with glue. Now, what is, uh, what is this? 100% rye. 100% rye. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's no no corn. We do there. Ten percent of the rye is malted rye, but it's mm -hmm. malted rye, not malted barley. Um, 
But yeah, we uh, we just decided to go all the way. There's no corn in. Now we have been playing around recently with some different rye recipes that Ashley's been working on with us that have some corn and in them and to try to um, you know just to try to change it up and get some more blending techniques because to me this is a cocktail rye. Um, this this makes a great cocktail, you know. Yeah. But some people that would say it's it's all it's so much allspice kind of punch and so much like spice it's you know but i still think it's got a viscosity that most people and i don't know if that's from the pot still or what caused it but there's still a little viscosity to it considering there's no corn and usually i would think most of your most of your viscosity probably comes from your corn that's what i would always assume but um <laughs> i mean i could see this being a great sazerac i mean some some pink shallots and some uh little simple and uh just that lemon wedge i think it'd be great but i mean flavor wise i think it it delivers plenty just to stand on its own well you must have tried it at 100 percent before you decided to bottle it 100 percent. yeah it's mighty good and the only other 100 percent rye i'm familiar with would be the canadian stuff that whistle pig puts out once in a while um but i'm all for 100 percent rye i mean if you want to taste rye let's taste some rye yeah who needs a doctorate? Did you do I drink this one? The, Luke knows this. This is one I probably drink more than anything else in my house. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, I know it's not everybody's favorite, uh, but it's my favorite for some reason. Just my home drink. Uh, maybe that's just because I love mm -hmm. rye that much. I, but, I think it's excellent. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's excellent. Yeah, yeah we, we've been, uh, the barrel team here lately, we've been this year, I think, God, two or three whistle pig picks. Um, so, I mean, we, we are rye drinkers and we, we, we drink rye and we love rye. So, I mean, that's, I was looking forward to this one because not only is because it's hundred percent rye, but just, we are rye drinkers. And I mean, this, you know. That's pretty brave. It uh, is. Congratulations. And it, and it drinks um, older than its age. I, I mm -hmm. think this one, uh, this, you feel like this one has been in the barrel longer than it probably really has. And we've got some older stuff coming on that too now. We haven't really been selling as much of the rye because we've been so focused on Tennessee and the bourbon that we haven't really sold any single barrels of rye. So we've got a few, we've got a few kind of stacked up older single barrels kind of sitting back there that we're waiting on. And mm -hmm. I think I'm excited about where the rye is going to go. And I'm yeah. really excited because we're trying to, we're trying some different recipes of rye that will give us some different blending techniques for it in the future too, which I'm excited about. So I, I I'm a big fan of it. So. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very nice rye, and uh, you said that was four years. Yeah, that one that blends actually right on five years. Okay, so that's a that was the last last blend we did was a six barrel blend, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not yeah. sure which blend you have, uh, but the last blend we did was was six barrels, and I think they were all like within a Borderline. month within a month right before five and right over five. So. Okay. So we mean, don't put age statements on any of our bottles. Um, obviously, so since you're in the bourbon world, you know that it has to be four years old or older to do yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I am getting pressure now to put, you know, because we've got some six-year-old stuff and five-year-old stuff out there to put yeah. age statements on it for my distributors. But to me, it's not really cool unless it hits like eight. <laughs> but that's just me. I guess I'm been selling well, the bigger brands. I'm with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you on that. Let them taste it. If you put five or six years old old on it they may not buy it because it's five or six years old mm -hmm. but uh, let them decide by tasting it. it it tastes great it's a good one you, you did well yeah right, ashley what do you think we should taste next the four grain four uh yes and, all right and you've got batch five right so that's that's the batch yeah. we just did yeah is that the new one yeah that's the accidental batch okay talk to me about the four grain what is it I can talk about <laughs> <laughs> So uh, before we go into the story of this one, um, the four grain is a blend of our, our three recipes, basically. So it's got all four grains in it. Um, so we kind of, each batch is a little bit different. Um, this one, I'll let her tell you how this one came about. <laughs> uh, I, how am I? <laughs> no. we, well, we messed up. We, uh, we messed up on our <laughs> bourbon recipe. And we, uh, one of my guys decided to pull a Tennessee whiskey barrel and put it in the bourbon recipe barrel. 
Um, but it was one of the pre-blends that was going into the final blend. So it was only like half of it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, oh, we didn't really go into that. What Ashley taught us, it's cool in blending, is when she profiles the barrels, she sends us these two or three profiles of the barrels. And she'll say, okay, all your grapefruit barrels, all your vanilla barrels, all your corn, whatever, you know. But she makes us harvest them, the light barrels together. So all these profiles that get harvested, these four barrels that get harvested together, then these four barrels that get harvested together, and these four, and then we'll blend those together. Because when you're tasting a small blend in the lab, you don't know if that's the same proportions you're gonna get out of the barrel. So we harvest the light ones together and then we kind of let them marry and sit. And so it's, it's amazing what she's taught us on how they mellow together. But yeah, one of the pre-blends that we were putting together for the bourbon one of my guys actually accidentally, it sounds like the old wild turkey. What's the ridiculous? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's actually real. <laughs> I'm guessing that one's probably real, maybe. I don't know. Um, but uh, this they, really put, happened. They, they put a Tennessee whiskey barrel in it. And I, we called Ashley, like, what do we do? I mean, technically, it's still bourbon because Tennessee, that old joke is Tennessee whiskey bourbon. Well, technically, it is bourbon, but. Uh, yeah, but it wasn't recipe. wheat. <laughs> so. So we ended up with a with a blend of our Tennessee whiskey and our bourbon together, which makes it a four grain. Um, yeah, it was delicious. But that that ended up with uh, I grabbed the husband, the baby, and the dog, and drove to Nashville. <laughs> and we had Greer and Jeff's little boy and my little boy in the floor with their trucks playing, while I was doing some blending and they were drinking. They were tasting. They weren't drinking. They were tasting. Um, yeah. Finalizing the, the wheat. <laughs> and, and this is our four grain product out of that. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, the four grain for us is kind of a fun project. It came about because we had first released uh, 20 single barrels of rye. When we were about, it was about two and a half years old. And we were going through and we were tasting some barrels. And we came across some of our rye barrels. And we're like, man, these are spectacular single barrels. And we didn't want to try to create a blend that we knew we couldn't recreate as it got older. So we decided to sell them as single barrels, not, not store pick single barrels. We just put them out as single barrels. Um, and so we thought that would last us about a year and a half. We're like, we'll just slowly kind of let these out to help us build the name while we get our stuff to at least four years old. And then I think we got a little shout out in Whiskey Advocate and they sold out like really quick. And we're like, well, dad gum, what do we do now? So we kind of came up, we didn't want to release any of our straight lines, our bourbon, rye, our Davis Reserve under four years old. Um, so we decided to kind of do some four grain blends. And the four grain was really kind of a short term thing that we were going to play around with. And we ended up loving it because we like it because it's kind of our fun play thing where any, every batch is going to be completely different. But it's also our way to kind of make a really balanced, you know, our goal with this is to kind of get all elements falling on the front, back, sides, kind of all the different finishes. Um, and it's just a really fun thing. I, and four grain starting to get some legs now. I mean, I think, you know, Taylor's got the four grain and people now kind of, there's some people who actually look for four grain. Um, what do y'all think of that one? Have y'all had that before? Well, I've had the other four grains you're talking about. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of, of all of those grains together. I, I, I really, just me personally, I prefer, you know, to get the taste of the dominant grain out of whatever I'm tasting. I think this one went well. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, I'm getting, I'm getting, definitely getting that same wheat that I tasted over there in your wheated bourbon. I'm also getting that rye and I'm, I'm getting the corn. And the corn is a sort of a background, way background, not as much background as we were talking about on, on one of the earlier ones. But it's a, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex bottle of whiskey. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nice to uh, you know as you sit with it. And uh, this one thing I like about four grain whiskey is, as you kind of pick it apart, you 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 pull out those characteristics from each grain. Yeah. yeah, I mean, not only just on the nose, but on, on the palate and the finish, you, you kind of can start to identify those unique flavors that, you know, well, there's definitely that rye, and there's that corn, there's that malt. I mean, that's, I, I enjoy that. You know, I, I think that's, and that's why I, again, I, I have cheated. This bottle is more empty than it, it was 
from what we pour today. Um, you know, I never thought of, I never thought about it that way, but that's a good way to kind of show people the different grains because that's what I like about four grain. And that's what we, we enjoy doing is trying to find a balance and make it sure you can kind of get all the different grains. But it is kind of fun because when you do, every time you taste it, you can say, okay, Sorry, guys. I was like, we're going to miss out on the Genesis, the best one. I know. Oh, I was, John and I were talking. I was so pissed. <laughs> I, if we miss the, that one freaking bottle, I'm, I'm just going to leave here. Get to it before it happens again. Yes. Yeah, so so we, we, the four grain we enjoyed, <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not taking chances on this Genesis. Yeah, the Genesis is my favorite one yet right now. Like, oh, yeah. It's so good. So that's what Genesis, I, I've got my iPad to pull it up. That was my the Genesis question. came about just so you know is uh we ended up we had a few people come down from Kentucky when we first started distilling uh, a few few uh, bigger guys that came down and tasted with us and helped us distill and kind of taught us a few things and we didn't want to we worked on our Tennessee whiskey recipe but we just didn't want a charcoal mellow in front of the Kentucky guys so just <laughs> so we decided to take our first twenty five barrels. And we didn't charcoal mellow them. And so it's our Tennessee whiskey recipe, but without charcoal mellow. And our, ten, our birthday is 1017, October 17th, because that's the first day we put whiskey into barrels. So every year we usually throw a big party and have a concert um, every year, except for 2020. It was a virtual party. Um, but, uh, but so we do 1,017 bottles released each year for, of, those, of those barrels. And so this one is a, it was a six year old bottle and bond. Uh, Ashley did this blend, so I'll kind of let her tell you how she came about it. But man, this is, this is my favorite one that we've come out with so far. Yeah, so we knew that we were getting towards the end of those 25 original barrels. And so I went into this knowing that I might not get to do just those originals and I might have to pick some five year to go into it to really complete the blend because I kind of use the genesis as you know that's like you only get three to four barrels depending on the volumes to hit that 1017 bottles so it's a challenge as a blender to get the most balanced the most complex like well-rounded whiskey you can get with just that few barrels so I was tasting through, I taste through Davidson Reserve uh, barrels regularly, like at least weekly. And so I was going through them. I was like, hey, I've got some of these Genesis barrels already. So before we even started talking about doing ge this year's Genesis, I had gone through those barrels and already picked out exactly what barrels I wanted to use. And I even picked out some younger ones because I started running the numbers and I was like, man, we're going to be on the bubble with this. I needed, and so I worked with Carter. I was like, hey, what were your volumes last year when you dumped? Like, how close are we really going to be? And it ended up um, that we did need that fourth barrel because last year's Genesis was just three barrels. So I went back and tested it. I had my three main ones and I was like, all right, which one do I want? Did a few more tests and I came up with this. And I tell you what, I, you all are tasting it. What do you think? Uh, this, you know, one thing I'll say about this one, and I, again, I cheated, you know, it is what it is. But the nose on this one, I spent a lot of time with because I loved it. I mean, Before we ever got online with you, I nosed them just from the bottle. And I, I lined them up in order of what I liked best by the nose, and Genesis was right there, number one. It's it's just got everything going for it. Yeah, it's, it's and, delicious. And, I'm jealous you guys are all tasting it right now, and my bottle's yeah. in the car. Well, you're con congratulations on it because it's it's pretty amazing <laughs> to to put out a um, you know a bourbon that tastes this well at this age, and and I, I think you. I mean, you really have to stretch to find something this age that tastes uh, taste this uh, mature. It's a good mature drink. Yeah, they've done a phenomenal job. Carter and Jeff make some delicious juice, and it's such a privilege for me to get to take that juice and just really have fun with it. Genesis is our version of our birthday bourbon, basically. Oh, so it's something we'll do, and we make we make twenty barrels each year, 
in, in, a, in honor of it, but we've still been using the ones from the first one. Now we'll take the rest of the original one and we'll probably start a Solera style from here on out. Nice. That's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, Carter and I drew out, a, a, it sounds like a pyramid scheme, but it's not, but we drew out on a bar napkin one day of doing a, an actual pyramid of barrels. And like, so the oldest barrels would be on the bottom. And so when you empty these out and we, and we've all, if we make 25 each year and we only use four to five each year, we'll always have more than we need to pick from. So okay. then the idea of it was, and we, we got to get with Ashley and make sure this works, is, you know, whenever we pull from the bottom, the blend we want, we kind of let refill down. And then we only fill up the top one with the top three or four with our favorite three or four from the oldest batch. And so if we've done it right, it should still get older every year. I think we've worked the math out where it'll last like 53 years till we have to go, till we kind of stop getting older. Um, which at that point, it's my son's problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure out the business plan. <laughs> yeah. That's where all the best Yeah, it'd be is your at. son and my son. <laughs> yeah, it'd be Clay and, Clay and Greer trying to figure that one out. Like, well, <laughs> they didn't think this one out all the way. Yeah, we did. We thought it out till we were gone. <laughs> but, uh, and, I, and, you know, one thing that I think is fun is to always, I, whenever we do one of these, because I know it's getting towards the end, and I know Ash has got to go to dinner, but is I always like to kind of pour a little bit of the Tennessee whiskey now right next to it. And the cool thing about that is, is the Tennessee whiskey, that Tennessee whiskey is about a five-year-old blend. Now, this, this one's about six-year-old. It's a year older, but it's, you know, it's not in the world of things. It's not that big. But it's the exact same recipe. It's the exact same method, exact same still same cook, everything, except one is charcoal melt and one isn't. You know, you can go to Jack or George or any of us and you can taste the, the distillate. And it's really, tasting distillate before and after charcoal melting is really impressive because if you're making moonshine, charcoal melting is awesome. <laughs> you know, it, it takes a lot of those fuse oils and those, those impurities out that maybe you don't, that maybe an older bourbon doesn't want to get out. But very rarely do you get to taste that, what that method does five years later. And so this is a really cool way to taste the true difference between a Tennessee whiskey and a bourbon five years later rather than at the distillate stage. Mm -hmm. You kind of got my attention a little bit earlier in the discussion when you mentioned on your Tennessee whiskey that you didn't use as much charcoal as others might use that you, 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 so does the amount of charcoal or the amount of depth of the charcoal, et cetera, et cetera, make a difference? But does it take, could you put one lump of charcoal in there and call it Tennessee whiskey? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, the craft distillers got into, uh, there was a battle a few years ago over the definition of Tennessee whiskey because there wasn't really one, you know, when it was just, you couldn't have a t distillery in Tennessee outside of Lincoln County up until 2009. Yeah. So all of a sudden in 2009, there's a bunch of us that opened up and then Diageo came in and said, try to change the laws to get rid of all laws of Tennessee whiskey. Uh, and they were claiming they were trying to help the small guys, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> we had to go, to, we had to all go to the legislature and say, if you think Diageo is here in town to help the small guys, let, 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 give us a second to talk to you. <laughs> like, Cause that's not the case, but, you know, that was a battle between uh, uh, Jack Daniels and Johnny Walker, because what most people, most people don't know is quietly earlier this year is a press release that Jack Daniels took over Johnny Walker as the number one sold whiskey in the world. Mm -hmm. And so Johnny Walker was really wanting to slow it down. So I think the idea was they wanted to change that law to where you could take sugar shine, put it in used barrels and slow it down. And I think the idea was they wanted to slow down the quality of Tennessee whiskey. And so we all kind of went to bat saying, no, we're, we don't want to lose out on the ability. There is, you know, whether you like Jack or you're not, they have created a franchise here. You know, no matter where you go in the world, people know what Tennessee whiskey is. Um, now, we did kind of come to the thing that eventually we'd like to maybe work with them on loosening up the charcoal mellowing part of the recipe to maybe allow different types of woods or, or things like that. But it just has to be dripped through it. So where you go to George Dickel fills up a vat from the bottom, they, they chill filter their whiskey and then they, they fill up the vat and they let it sit and then they let it drain out. Um, and then Jack slowly drips it through these big massive vats and it drips through, I think eight feet or 10 feet. No, I can't remember. They've got a certain number of feet they do it through. Um, 
uh, for us, we use about a six inch tube and wow. we just kind of, <clears throat> we just kind of run it through really quick. Uh, charcoal mellowing, if it was done through oak, it would, you, it would be just like what you're doing in a barrel. Um, it's the sugar maple that really is the main difference. Uh, you know, the Tuttletown, the Hudson Valley guys actually did a study on all the different super aging techniques and what it does on the molecular level to the millionth degree and, and with spirals and this. And they all actually came to the conclusion that the charcoal, the Lincoln County process was the number one factor of that. I think that it rips a lot of the fuse oils out and it, it filters some of the stuff out that we kind of like. Um, it does add some sweetness uh, through because it's sugar maple. So we drip it through fast, but we try to make it more of an additive of just picking up a little bit of sweetness without stripping out too many of those, what, you know, those flavors that we kind of want to be in there. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, so it is smooth. It's got to make a difference on, on how you put it through the charcoal. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's all good bourbon when you start, but how you put it through that charcoal has to be a deciding factor on what, what you put in the bottle. Yeah, right. I remember when I, used to, when I used to sell wild turkey, I sometimes always remember I was like 24. And I'll never forget uh -huh. meeting Jimmy Russell for the first time. And I was, uh, he told me I was from Tennessee. He goes, well, you need to tell your boys down there if they could distill their stuff right, they wouldn't have to run through that sugar maple. <laughs> I was like, what is that about? <laughs> that sounds so much like <laughs> I was like. <laughs> but Eddie would never say that. <laughs> All right, guys, I need to get off here. And uh, so my cohorts do not leave me. Oh, have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you so All right, much thanks for having me, guys. And uh, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. All right. Thank you for I'm having me to let me crash your Zoom. Oh, you did not crash it at all. You, he Most added so time. much. We cannot thank you enough. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks, have a good have night. A dinner. All right, Jeff, we won't keep you. I know you got a, you got a little one in a family. Um, but thank you again for not just this, but your hospitality back in March. I mean, taking out damn near half a day to show me around. And um, I mean, that's the fun doing, stuff. Y'all are doing wonderful things up there in Music City, and what is this for Tennessee? That's that's the Tennessee. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> See, I told you it won me over when I was up there. Uh, and I got to taste the barrel proof. Um, you know, you had a barrel proof on the shelf. Yeah. That we, I didn't bring that because I actually finished that bottle. Unfortunately. Yeah. So we do. We do. Uh, and I know if we we unfortunately we're with Lewis Bear. Uh, well. Not important. I like Lewis Bear. We're with the Bud Distributor, but they only cover to Apalachicola. Yeah. So they don't reach over into Jacksville. Uh, I've been talking, I, I was originally with Southern with my first brand and, you know, being a small brand in Florida with Southern was tough, but uh, we're talking to a couple other guys. So eventually we'd like to get down there, but just so you know, so I know you have a store there. Um, we do single barrels at Cash Strength. Um, and all of our single barrels for our bourbon and our Tennessee whiskey at cash strength retail at thirty nine ninety nine. Wow. So, so they, they great, usually great. do pretty well. So when we do get down there, I'd love to I'd be honored to love to have you come or even have you come up here or I'll come down there and eventually when we get some distribution in your area, maybe we can do our first single barrel pick with you at Market Square and well, I, I think have you all come and pick I, out a barrel. Yeah, I think for sure we can do that. Yeah. And uh and the other thing I heard in our conversation was that you both were very excited about some of these single barrels, as a matter of fact. So you, you put them out of single barrels, you like them so much. Yeah, I'd be, we'd like a shot at yeah. that. <laughs> that yeah, we do about, we, we, we release about eight to 10 single barrels a year, or a That's month, that. I'm sorry. And um, and we, you know, like you said, we, we lay down quite a bit of, I mean, for a small guy, I mean, shoot. Jack lays down 2,800 barrels a, a, year, a day. We lay down at 800 a year, but 800 a year is pretty good for a small guy with, oh, yeah. like us. And we, we uh, just for instance, on our, our bourbon, that we did a, a non-barrel blend. We technically have about 330 barrels that were over four years old. So we, we're holding back quite a bit to get older. Um, we sell a lot of vodka to pay the bills, you know, so. <laughs> And, and, and we do a lot of co-packing. So we do other things to try to cash flow it. So we've got quite a bit of single barrels and, and, and blends, and we're, we're excited to kind of start growing it out now. Great to spend some time with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, it's been quite enjoyable. And thank you for all this. Uh, thank you for sitting down with us again. This was 
tons of fun and and you know we'll we'll definitely keep an eye on everything and and maybe we'll do this again soon and and come back up to nashville when this when this whole thing's over hopefully oh listen <laughs> yeah. my wife and i but we we love nashville it's our favorite place and we, we're, we round, we're rounding the curve. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Because <laughs> uh, I need to get... I need to on one station you listen to. I'll turn on one station. Like, we're rounding the curve. I turn on another station. It's like, oh, it's I the mean, worst day in the history. I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get back up. And, and you know, when I'm there, I will definitely pay you all a visit again. Because yeah. I just, I love everything you're doing. But... Uh, Thank you so much, Jeff. In the meantime, y'all enjoy those bottles. And if you need any more, you just uh, email me and we'll get you some more down there. Oh, so. don't tell me that. <laughs> You'll get an email <laughs> in five minutes. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, Jeff. Thank you Cheers, so much. Guys. Cheers. Cheers.